chapter seventeen of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen peppino's story at the appointed hour of which he had been duly notified by the procureur de la Republique, the count of monte cristo entered the room set apart for the use of the juge d'instruction at the police post where peppino and beppo were confined the magistrate was already on the judicial bench and by his side stood the deputy procureur who was explaining to him the wishes of his superior as monte cristo came in he bowed to the juge and the deputy who returned his salute with all the respect due to so exalted a personage messieurs said the count after this exchange of civilities you are of course aware of the reason of my presence here this afternoon so we can proceed to business at once but before the italians are brought in i have a slight favour to ask name it monsieur the count said the juge d'instruction blandly we shall be happy to grant it if it lies within our power to do so well messieurs said the count of monte cristo stepping upon the platform and leaning on the juge's desk it is simply this the prisoner calling himself peppino is in possession of certain details to which i attach considerable importance he has promised to reveal them to me as the price of his liberty and that of his companion it is needless to say that the sole motive of my interference in this matter is to obtain these details now from long experience i know all the trickery and treachery of the italian nature once free this man might snap his fingers in my face and refuse to speak after the formalities of the law have been duly complied with i wish the prisoners remanded to their cells and informed that their liberation will take place only when peppino has given me the promised intelligence that will be but a trifling stretch of my authority replied the juge d'instruction smiling if it is any stretch whatever for as i understand the case the prisoners are to remain virtually in your custody until their departure from france for which you have pledged your word to the procureur de la republique hence the favour you ask shall be cheerfully granted as he concluded the juge d'instruction glanced at the deputy procureur who nodded assent the magistrate touched a bell that stood on his desk and said to the gardien de la paix who answered the summons bring in the prisoners monte cristo and the deputy retired from the platform seating themselves in a couple of fauteuils placed at a table immediately in front of the juge's desk as the two italians were brought in peppino glanced first at the magistrate on the bench and then at the deputy finally his eyes rested on the count when his countenance instantly lighted up he instinctively felt that monte cristo's mysterious influence had been fully as potent with the authorities of paris as with luigi vampa and his band that the wonderful man had succeeded in effecting the liberation of himself and beppo place the prisoners at the bar said the juge d'instruction addressing the gardien this order was instantly complied with and the two italians stood facing the magistrate remove your hats the prisoners obeyed peppino with a confident smile beppo with a sullen scowl prisoners at the bar said the juge d'instruction severely you are charged with the offence of picking pockets upon the public street what have you to say this formal and rather menacing beginning was both a surprise and a disappointment to peppino he glanced inquiringly at monte cristo but could read nothing in his pale handsome face then with a dark frown he made answer to the juge in a harsh defiant tone i am not guilty the magistrate glanced at beppo who in his turn repeated his comrade's words 
here the deputy procureur arose and said to the juge d'instruction in a full clear voice may it please you honoured juge as the representative of the procureur de la république i desire to state that it is not my intention to push the charge against the prisoners at the bar for this course i have a good and sufficient reason i therefore in my official capacity demand that the persons calling themselves peppino and beppo be discharged this demand was another surprise to peppino but he instantly divined that monte cristo counted for a great deal in it and gazed at him with a look of gratitude beppo was absolutely astounded for he could not understand the sudden favourable turn in the situation the juge d'instruction in pursuance of the form prescribed by law said to the deputy may i ask the worthy representative of the procureur de la république what are his good and sufficient reasons certainly honoured juge replied the functionary his excellency the count of monte cristo here present has entered into a compact with the procureur pledging himself in the event of the prisoner's discharge to induce them to quit france immediately at this monte cristo arose and facing the judicial bench said in that impressive manner which always marked his public speeches honoured juge what the deputy procureur has just said is perfectly true in every respect in the event of the prisoner's discharge i stand pledged to his superior in office to see that they return to italy without delay the deputy and the count resumed their seats the juge d'instruction appeared to think for a moment then he said my duty in the premises is plain no evidence is presented against the prisoners and the official statement and demand of the procureur de la république expressed through his worthy and esteemed representative preclude the necessity of a formal interrogation of the accused i shall therefore discharge them subject however to the control of his excellency the count of monte cristo prisoners at the bar he added addressing peppino and beppo i remand you to your cells your liberation to take place at such time as his excellency the count of monte cristo may determine he resumed his seat upon the judicial bench motioning to the gardien to remove the prisoners ten minutes later monte cristo was in peppino's cell the italian was radiant with delight and very effusive in the expression of his thanks to his powerful and mysterious benefactor the count waved his hand impatiently a truce to thanks he said time presses and the sooner you give me the details of the conspiracy against the viscount massetti the sooner you and your companion will be free peppino threw himself half down upon his bed and monte cristo seated himself on a rickety stool his usually impassible countenance plainly showing the absorbing interest he felt in what was to follow the italian cleared his throat and began signor count said he in the first place i must tell you that young massetti has been disowned and disinherited by his proud stern father who believes him one of the guiltiest and most depraved scoundrels on earth monte cristo gave a start his face grew a shade paler than was habitual with him but he said nothing he was eagerly awaiting further developments that is not all however continued peppino after a slight pause to note the effect of his communication upon his auditor nor is it the worst the unfortunate viscount upon being ignominiously expelled from the palazzo massetti by the old count's orders immediately lost his senses he is now a raving maniac mon dieu mon dieu exclaimed monte cristo springing to his feet and pacing the cell a prey to intense agitation he did not endeavour to control a raving maniac giovanni a raving maniac oh my daughter my daughter all i say is the truth resumed the italian as i hope for heaven i swear it 
but what has become of massetti where is he demanded the count abruptly pausing in his walk has he been consigned to some asylum he is an outcast and a wanderer replied peppino all rome frowns upon him avoids him as a pestilence is avoided when i left italy he had sought refuge amid the ruins of the Colosseum, where he was the terror alike of visitors and the superstitious guides i saw him there with my own eyes the day before my departure he was in rags carried a tall staff wore a crown of ivy leaves and spent his time cursing god and man they say he never leaves the ruins save to beg a few scraps upon which to subsist and that he sleeps at night in the depths of a dark vomitorium in company with bats spiders and other unclean things this is incredible cried monte cristo gazing piercingly at his companion and half suspecting that he was drawing upon his vivid italian imagination for some of his graphic details but it is true signor count protested peppino earnestly every word of it is true go on said monte cristo hoarsely again seating himself on the stool tell me about the conspiracy i am coming to it signor count said the former bandit assuming a sitting posture upon the edge of the bed you know of course that the cause of all the viscount massetti's trouble was a certain handsome young peasant girl named annunziata solara i have heard it was some woman but that does not matter proceed this girl sold flowers in the piazza del popolo and on the corso there she attracted the attention of massetti and your son esperance esperance exclaimed monte cristo his hands working nervously oh mon dieu the light is commencing to break peppino smiled reassuringly have no fear signor count said he in all the unhappy occurrences that brought the poor viscount under suspicion your son bore a part as noble as it was honourable you have abundant reason to be proud of him monte cristo uttered a sigh of relief can you prove this i can luigi vampa and his whole band know your son to be entirely innocent so far as the flower-girl is concerned and will so express themselves even old solara himself hardened and despicable wretch as he is will not seek to inculpate him rest assured that the proof of your son's innocence is ample luigi vampa has already written to me that no guilt attaches to esperance but i must have more reliable vouchers than the letter or even the oath of a notorious brigand such vouchers can be procured without much difficulty the unfortunate girl herself who is now in the refuge at civita vecchia will exculpate him but the details of the plot the details of the plot well the viscount learned from annunziata that she dwelt in the country beyond the trastevere and that evening set out to find her your son who knew his object followed him to protect him against the bandits massetti was halted by one of vampa's men who wounded him in the struggle that ensued your son appearing in time to kill the brigand and rescue his friend shortly afterwards they encountered a large number of vampa's band and narrowly escaped being hung to the nearest trees in revenge for the death of the man slain by your son they were set free by vampa himself as soon as he learned that esperance was your son massetti having disclosed both his own identity and that of his comrade the young men it seems had determined to return to rome immediately after the viscount received his wound but massetti grew faint from pain and loss of blood and it was resolved to seek for shelter a peasant appeared at this juncture and after some hesitation agreed to conduct them to his father's cabin where they could pass the night he was as good as his word to be brief the young men who were disguised as peasants soon found themselves in pasquale solara's hut and in the presence of the fair annunziata herself peppino paused for an instant and then continued these preliminary details signor count are necessary to enable you to understand the conspiracy which was speedily to be hatched 
the peasant who had conducted massetti and your son to the very spot the former had left rome to seek was annunziata's brother old pasquale solara was absent from home at the time of the arrival of the strangers but returned shortly afterwards i have no doubt that he had long been in league with luigi vampa and had been secretly acting as his agent and confederate at any rate when he arrived he was well aware that the young men were at his cabin and was also thoroughly informed as to their identity though with his habitual cunning he concealed both facts feigning surprise and dissatisfaction when it was announced to him by his children that he had guests secretly he was delighted for the presence of young massetti gave him an opportunity at once to take a signal revenge on the old count whom he had long bitterly hated and to divert the crashing stigma of a fiendish act he meditated from himself to the name and fame of another do you mean to assert that this wretched old man had base designs against his own daughter said the count his visage expressing all the horror he felt exactly answered peppino coolly old solara miserable miser as he is had for a very large sum of the gold he so ardently coveted sold his own child his beautiful daughter annunziata to the bandit chief luigi vampa the black-hearted demon exclaimed monte cristo he is unworthy of the name of man in paris the indignant populace would crush him to death beneath their feet so you see resumed the italian the arrival of massetti was opportune and pasquale solara after having seen that the viscount was safely housed beneath the roof of his cabin hastened back to luigi vampa and together they laid the foul plot that succeeded but too well a more shrewdly devised and thoroughly concealed piece of diabolical villainy has never stained the annals of the civilized world End of chapter 17。chapter 18 of Monte Cristo's daughter by Edmund Flagg。this librivox recording is in the public domain。chapter 18 。more of Peppino's story。Monte Cristo was horrified by what he had heard。his whole soul revolted at the idea of a father who could deliberately and in cold blood sell his daughter at the idea of a wretch who with equal deliberation could cast the blame of a villainy committed by himself upon an innocent man it had seemed very strange to the count at the time luigi vampa had written to him that the brigand chief should be so thoroughly posted in regard to the innocence of esperance and the guilt of the viscount massetti but in the light of the astounding revelations just made by peppino it became abundantly clear that vampa in the young italian's case had been actuated by the strongest possible motive namely the desire to shield himself and that in order to do so effectually he had not shrunk from the vilest and most complete falsehood of course vampa had not wished to inculpate esperance because of the old-time compact the relations that had subsisted between him and monte cristo in the past that was equally plain besides one victim was sufficient and in selecting massetti as that victim the brigand chief had evidently acted at the instigation of old pasquale solara peppino proceeded with his disclosures signor count said he i had long suspected that something was on the carpet between vampa and old solara the moody and morose shepherd did not at first come to the bandit's haunt but in response to a signal he used a peculiar vibrating whistle the chief would go out alone and meet him this signal and vampa's actions aroused my curiosity more than once i followed the chief and securely hidden behind a tree or a rock witnessed the secret meetings overhearing portions of the conversation annunziata solara was frequently mentioned and the father seemed to be endeavouring to drive a hard bargain with vampa at last one night they came to an understanding 
i heard the chief agree to pay old pasquale an enormous sum of money upon the delivery of annunziata into his hands and then i realized that the nefarious sale had been concluded it was decided that the ill-fated girl should be passed over to vampa at the first opportunity and that opportunity came when the viscount massetti and your son esperance were domiciled at the isolated cabin in the forest i was on the alert and when after assuring himself of the arrival of the two young men at his hut old pasquale sought the bandit's rendezvous and sounded his vibrating signal i heard it stealthily following vampa i concealed myself as i had done on previous occasions i was now thoroughly familiar with the details of the base transaction in progress between the precious pair and could readily comprehend even their most obscure and guarded allusions old solara informed the chief that the young men had arrived proposing that vampa should abduct annunziata at the earliest possible moment so arranging matters that suspicion would fall upon the viscount massetti this the chief agreed to do the shepherd was to keep him posted and the abduction was to take place when circumstances were best calculated to promote the success of all the phases of the villainous plot with this understanding the conspirators separated fate sided with old pasquale and vampa his wound kept the viscount at the cabin and the fair nunziata nursed him he had become smitten with her beauty the day he met her in the piazza del popolo intimate association with her intensified her influence over him and when he had been in the cabin nearly a week and convalescence had begun he made violent love to her even going so far as to ask her to fly with him esperance divined his friend's intentions and knowing that massetti could not marry the girl interposed to save her the result was a quarrel and your son challenged the viscount to fight him the challenge was instantly accepted and it was arranged that the duel should occur on the following morning faithful to his promise to vampa old solara while pretending to be absent from home lurked in the vicinity and kept track of all that was going on he was hidden beneath the open window when massetti or tonio as he called himself for both the viscount and esperance were passing under assumed names proposed flight to his daughter instantly he hastened to the brigand chief who had been prowling in the neighbourhood of the hut all day and gleefully communicated to him what he had heard it was immediately decided that the time for the abduction had come and preparations were made to carry off annunziata that very night vampa wrote a criminating letter to the girl purporting to come from massetti and old solara stealing unobserved into the hut placed it beneath his daughter's work-box on her table where she afterwards found it it was not for a moment supposed that the girl would consent to fly with the viscount for though gay and light-hearted she was pure and innocent the note was simply intended to fill annunziata's mind after the abduction with the idea that massetti was her abductor what shrewd far-seeing villainy muttered monte cristo between his teeth that night there was no moon continued peppino and after all the inmates of the cabin had retired to rest old pasquale waited outside with a torch while vampa made his way to annunziata's chamber tore her from her couch and carried her to the forest preventing her from giving the alarm by placing his hand over her mouth he was masked and the shepherd kept at such a distance that it was utterly impossible for his daughter to recognize him as vampa ran through the forest with his burden he struck his arm against a tree and the pain caused him to take his hand for a second from annunziata's mouth the poor girl profited by this opportunity to scream and her cry brought first her brother and then the viscount and then esperance to her aid the brother on reaching vampa attacked him fiercely 
dropping the girl who stood rooted to the spot the chief drew a pistol and fired at his assailant the latter was hit and staggered back the blood gushing from his wound somehow during the struggle vampa became unmasked and in the prevailing obscurity annunziata naturally imagined that the face suddenly uncovered and as quickly masked again was that of her suitor the so-called tonio having disposed of the brother who afterwards ran back towards the cabin met espérance rushed into his arms and then fell to the ground where he died the brigand chief seized annunziata who meanwhile had swooned and resumed his flight through the forest hearing the sound of further pursuit vampa paused in dismay and listened three persons seemed to be rapidly approaching the chief thereupon concealed the unconscious girl behind a huge fragment of rock and threw himself flat upon the ground hoping thus to escape observation as he did so he saw the glare of old solara's torch it flashed full in the face of a peasant a perfect stranger who had heard annunziata's cry and come to the rescue the shepherd had a knife in one hand he instantly cast away his torch and closed in desperate conflict with the newcomer at that moment the viscount came upon the scene moving as if to take the part of the stranger vampa leaped up grasped him by the throat and under the threat of instant death if he refused forced him to take an oath of silence in regard to the events of the night massetti was so bewildered that he scarcely knew what he was doing no sooner had he taken the oath than vampa treacherously dealt him a crushing blow that sent him reeling to the ground where he lay motionless and unconscious then the chief again threw himself upon the soil springing up once more to face esperance the latter aimed a pistol at him but he whirled it from his hand then the young man struck fiercely at him but vampa dodged the blow and his adversary fell forward from his own impetus on a thick growth of moss beside massetti's prostrate form taking prompt advantage of his opportunity the chief secured possession of the yet unconscious annunziata and this time succeeded in bearing her in triumph to a hut he had provided for her reception peppino then proceeded to relate what the reader has already learned from annunziata's pitiful recital to madame de racogna in the refuge at civita vecchia when he had concluded he glanced at his auditor and said are you satisfied signor count i am answered monte cristo in a hoarse voice that sounded strangely unlike his own you have fully earned the freedom of yourself and your comrade beppo the tale of black iniquity you have so vividly told me might seem improbable in other ears but to me it bears the impress of truth one point however is obscure i cannot imagine in what manner you learned the particulars of certain events in your narrative events which you could not have witnessed with your own eyes enlighten me on this point willingly answered peppino without the slightest hesitation i learned the details you speak of partly from vampa himself and partly from old solara the twain compared notes after the latter had openly joined the bandits and i took good care to overhear their conversation monte cristo had arisen and now paced the cell for several moments plunged in deep thought his brow was cloudy and dark but his eyes sparkled fiercely and his hands were clenched so tightly that his nails left red marks in his flesh the italian still sitting on the edge of his bed watched him narrowly not knowing what to make of his preoccupation and agitated by a vague fear lest he might refuse to fulfil his promise at length monte cristo appeared to have solved the knotty problem that had perplexed him and to have arrived at a decision he came in front of the italian halted and gazing steadfastly at him said my good fellow i have as you know obtained freedom for yourself and beppo by pledging my word to the procureur de la republique that both of you shall at once quit the country on your side you have done as you agreed and i am now about to execute my part of the bargain peppino's countenance assumed an expression of the utmost delight all his apprehensions instantly vanished now continued monte cristo impressively 
i have a proposition to make to you you can be exceedingly useful to me if you will and at the same time acquire a large sum of money honestly and honourably the italian's eyes glittered with pleasure name your proposition signor count he said enthusiastically i accept it in advance but is beppo included in it he is answered the count the revelations you have made to me have decided me to go to rome at once i shall take my daughter with me as well as my nubian servant ali i desire you and beppo to enter my service and accompany me humanity demands that i use all my influence to right the unfortunate viscount massetti and i wish you to aid me in the work i will do as you desire signor count said the italian and i will promise that beppo shall also comply with your wishes very well rejoined monte cristo it is understood and agreed upon one condition however i must exact you and beppo must hold no communication with luigi vampa or any of his band at least not until i so direct the condition shall be scrupulously observed signor count while in your service your command shall be our only law it is sufficient now i am going to set you and beppo at liberty you will at once accompany me to my residence and there the preparations for our departure will immediately be made we shall start for rome to-morrow as your excellency pleases said the italian monte cristo summoned the guardian on duty at the post directing him to produce beppo and soon the count and the italians were seated in the former's barouche and being rapidly driven by ali towards the mansion on the rue du helder no sooner had they arrived at their destination than the count giving the new additions to his retinue into the charge of the faithful nubian repaired to his study summoning zuleika to him the girl hastened to obey the summons and the sight of her father's pale stern countenance instantly told her that something very unusual and important had taken place my child said the count taking her tenderly in his arms and gazing fondly into her upturned anxious face i have to-day received some very startling intelligence zuleika's heart beat wildly at this announcement she felt convinced that the very startling intelligence concerned her unfortunate long silent lover father said she in a tremulous voice have you received word from the viscount massetti no my child answered monte cristo but tidings of the gravest nature relating to him have been imparted to me tidings of the gravest nature father is it possible that he is dead as she uttered the last words the poor girl burst into a flood of tears no my child replied the count young massetti is not dead has he succeeded in clearing himself of that terrible charge the girl asked trembling with anxiety alas no but he is innocent zuleika as innocent of the dreadful crime imputed to him as the babe unborn of that you can rest assured for the proof of his innocence is in my hands zuleika gave a wild cry of joy and flung her arms about her father's neck calm yourself my child resumed monte cristo all will yet be well i start for rome to-morrow with ali and two of giovanni's friends be ready to accompany me zuleika's ecstasy was almost beyond bounds but alas she did not know that giovanni's mind had been overthrown by the shame and disgrace that had been heaped upon him End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the maniac of the Colosseum. after quitting their guides at the Colosseum, maximilian and valentine advanced towards the centre of the gladiatorial arena where the demented giovanni massetti was standing he did not notice them did not seem to pay even the slightest attention to his surroundings but kept his eyes upturned towards heaven the murmur of bitter malediction constantly issuing from his lips as monsieur and madame morel approached his words became clearer and clearer 
and they had no difficulty whatever in fully understanding their terrible import no wonder the gods were frightened by such a flow of bitter scathing curses the afflicted viscount maintained his motionless statue-like attitude resembling more the weird creation of some sculptor's vivid fancy than a living breathing mortal valentine was filled with indescribable sorrow as she gazed at him and realized that this wreck of noble glorious manhood was the beloved of zuleika's heart the being with whose unhappy destiny that of monte cristo's daughter was inextricably entwined oh that by some miracle such as the fabled divinities of old olympus were said to have performed he might be restored to reason and the possession of an unblemished name but the days of miracles were over and if the young italian was to be brought back to sanity and cleared from the fearful charge against him that had wrought all this harm this misery it must be by earthly and ordinary means perhaps she and her husband were destined to work these apparently impossible changes who knew many things equally improbable had happened and why should not this wondrous transformation a transformation worthy of the wand of some potent prospero be effected valentine was a devoted friend and an enthusiast and monte cristo's maxim wait and hope was her guiding star wait and hope oh how cheering how reassuring was that simple trustful motto maximilian on his side felt unutterable pity for both the wretched man before him and the lovely zuleika the sweet and tender child of his benefactor languishing and despairing far away in her father's luxurious palatial home the poor girl was surrounded by all the blessings that unbounded wealth could confer she had the count's love mercedes love esperance's love and the sincere affection of all who knew her but alas princely riches parental brotherly love and the affection of friends were as nothing compared to the passion that was gnawing at her vitals a desperate hopeless passion that was but a heavy weight of woe but was this passion altogether desperate and hopeless time alone could show monsieur and madame morel were now within a few feet of the hapless crazed young man but his attention was so engrossed by the mad thoughts surging through his bewildered brain that he yet failed to detect their presence bidding valentine remain where she was her husband drew close beside giovanni and suddenly placed his hand on his shoulder the viscount started at this unexpected interruption of his sombre reverie and hastily glanced at the intruder his eyes however had a stony uncomprehending stare expressing neither surprise nor fear giovanni massetti said maximilian listen to me i am a friend the young man replied in a low discordant voice who is it mentions giovanni massetti there was once a man who bore that name but he is dead dead to the world i have told you i am a friend resumed m morel i have come to save you a friend a friend cried the maniac with a burst of bitter mocking laughter that pierced maximilian through and through like a sharp pointed keen edged stiletto and made valentine shudder as if she had come in contact with polar ice a friend a friend come to save me me ha 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 a labour of hercules with no hercules to accomplish it you are mad my poor fellow besides i am not giovanni massetti i am a king an emperor behold my sceptre and my crown he pointed to his tall staff and the wreath of ivy leaves encircling his head pointed triumphantly and with all the dignity of a throned monarch it was a pitiful sight in the highest degree pitiful this spectacle of intellect overthrown of the glorious mental light of youthful manhood which had become clouded and obscured maximilian was deeply affected but knowing full well that all his firmness 
resolution and resources would be requisite in dealing with the wretched man he had come so far to aid he controlled his emotion and said in a comparatively steady voice giovanni massetti in the name of the woman you love in the name of zuleika monte cristo's daughter i conjure you to be calm and hear me i am her ambassador i come to you from her the young man put his hand to his forehead and seemed to be striving to collect his scattered senses zuleika zuleika he murmured monte cristo's daughter yes yes i have heard of her before a long time back in the dreary past i read of her in some book of history or the verses of some oriental poet she was a queen yes she was a queen well what of this zuleika he stood as if waiting for some arabian romance to be unfolded to him with parted lips and a vacant smile sorrowful to see since his interview with the old count massetti maximilian's hope for the success of his difficult mission had been but a very slender thread now that thread was stretched to its utmost tension and zuleika's ambassador felt that it must shortly snap asunder and vanish irrecoverably love is ever a potent influence with man but this poor demented creature appeared to have lost even the faintest conception of the crowning passion of life since zuleika's name the name of his betrothed had failed to awaken his memory or touch a sympathetic chord in his bosom as maximilian stood uncertain what to do next but as yet reluctant to abandon the miserable viscount to his fate valentine came to him and placing her hand on his arm said my husband it is useless to endeavour to move this unfortunate man in his present condition his mind is incapable of rational action only by care and soothing influence can he be restored to himself he must be induced to accompany us to some asylum some institution where he can be treated for his dreadful malady you are right valentine as you always are answered m morrel the course you suggest is the only one to be taken at this juncture but how is giovanni to be induced to accompany us force cannot be employed we have no legal right to use it and i greatly fear that the viscount will not follow us of his own accord no matter to what solicitations we may resort trust that to me maximilian rejoined valentine sweetly and persuasively remember what i said about a woman's wit and tenderness i remember it and now if ever is the time for the trial of their power for i have utterly failed but surely valentine you do not propose to risk dealing with this poor man whose mind is reduced to chaos and who might in a sudden access of unaccountable fury do you harm even before i could interfere i certainly do propose dealing with him i am an enchantress you know and now you shall witness a further and more convincing proof of the potency of my spells than was shown in bringing your dead hope to life maximilian was not altogether satisfied with his wife's heroic resolution but she firmly persisted in it and finally he allowed her to have her way she quitted his side and approached giovanni her fine countenance wearing a bewitching smile as seductive as that of a scandinavian valkyria ministering at the feast of heroes in the fabled valhalla the guides who amid their petitions to the blessed virgin had steadily watched the singular proceedings of their patrons were both astounded and horrified when they saw valentine leave her husband and boldly walk towards the maniac they redoubled the fervency of their prayers and breathlessly waited for what was about to happen the viscount had not yet observed valentine when she came in front of him and paused still smiling he saw her for the first time dropping his staff he clasped his hands and gazed at her in an ecstasy of admiration what beautiful what heavenly vision is this he exclaimed ardently his voice assuming more of the characteristics of humanity than it had yet displayed valentine was silent she wished to get massetti completely under her influence before speaking to him 
motionless and statuesquely she stood allowing the maniac to gaze his fill at her who are you divine vision continued the viscount seeming to think himself the prey of some passing dream oh you are a spirit a goddess such as of old presided over the sports of the Colosseum. perhaps juno herself do not vanish from my sight do not become a filmy cloud and dissolve in ether oh speak to me glorious apparition let me hear the celestial melody of your voice and die listening to its marvellous cadences valentine humouring the caprice of the demented man said in the most enticing tone she could assume you have guessed aright o oh mortal i am indeed juno the queen of the goddesses of mount olympus by the direct command of jupiter i have sought you out this night she came closer to him and took his hand he raised hers to his lips and devotedly kissed it then he gazed into her eyes like one entranced woman's wit and tenderness had triumphed the maniac whom even the mention of zuleika's name had failed to touch was completely under madame morel's influence she had subdued him she could do with him as she wished a miracle a miracle cried both the cicerones simultaneously the blessed virgin be praised maximilian was not less astonished than the guides but with his astonishment joy and gratitude were mingled joy that giovanni was now tractable and gratitude to his noble and fearless wife who had effected the wondrous transformation he said to himself that valentine was indeed an enchantress but a modern circe who unlike her ancient prototype employed her spells and fascinations to promote good results he glanced at valentine with a smile of encouragement and approbation eagerly waiting for the next step she should take for the next audacious effort she should essay giovanni made no reply to valentine's fantastic speech and after preserving silence for an instant she resumed i am here for your welfare to aid you in your overwhelming misfortunes ah yes i have misfortunes but i had forgotten them said the young man musingly i am sent to relieve you of them continued valentine then throwing into her voice its most persuasive quality she added fixing a magnetic gaze upon the viscount my mission is to take charge of you to see that you are restored to health and happiness come with me i will follow you sweet vision to the very end of the earth said giovanni enthusiastically valentine hastily beckoned to her husband he hurried to her and she whispered in his ear send one of the guides for a coupe we must not lose a single moment poor massetti will follow me as a dog follows its master while he is under my influence it is imperative that he be removed to an asylum where he can be properly looked after and if possible cured no doubt the guides can tell you of such an institution use the utmost dispatch maximilian the young soldier needed no repetition of these wise and humanitarian injunctions he gave the requisite directions and soon the desired vehicle was in readiness without the Colosseum. maximilian had also ascertained the address of a proper curative institution meanwhile valentine had continued to employ her successful tactics with the viscount who every moment yielded to her more and more when the coupe was announced she said to him my chariot is waiting to convey you to my olympian abode will you come with me your wishes are my laws o oh, beautiful goddess replied giovanni take me where you will so that you do not desert me and leave me to perish in despair madame morel led the unresisting young man to the coupe maximilian and the guides following the pair at a short distance in order to guard against any unforeseen freak on the part of poor massetti there was no occasion for their services however and the viscount was soon safely installed in the coupe with valentine upon one side of him and her husband upon the other 
after a brief drive during which giovanni who seemed to have lost all comprehension of the presence of any one save valentine remained quietly gazing at her the vehicle drew up in front of the insane asylum massetti was induced to enter the institution without the slightest trouble maximilian thereupon made all the necessary arrangements and the young man was placed in comfortable quarters the physician who examined him stated that his case was not beyond hope End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty the isle of monte cristo at the appointed time the count of monte cristo and zuleika accompanied by ali peppino and beppo the two italians attired in the travelling garb of french servants left paris for marseilles on their arrival at the latter city they proceeded immediately to the harbour where monte cristo's yacht awaited them in obedience to instructions telegraphed by the count to the captain of the craft whose name was vincenzo and who was a son of jacopo the former smuggler long in command of the ill-fated alcyon lost in the frightful storm and volcanic disturbance in the mediterranean some years before the present yacht was a new and superb vessel as fleet and as beautiful as a bird it was fitted up in the most complete manner the cabin superbly carpeted and furnished was hung with elaborately wrought costly tapestry while here and there on the walls were curiously arrayed clusters of ancient barbaric weapons gathered from the site of old carthage the ruins of historic babylon and even from the crumbling tombs of those redoubtable warriors who far back in the dim ages of antiquity had defended distant cathay against the incursions of the fierce tartar hordes the yacht was named the heyday in honour of the loving and devoted greek slave the mother of esperance and zuleika who had filled such an important part in monte cristo's life and had left behind her such tender memories as soon as the count and his little party were safely on board the craft it set sail gliding swiftly out upon the wide sparkling expanse of water monte cristo and zuleika stood upon the deck conversing pleasantly and enjoying the ever-changing panorama presented to their gaze the heyday glided swiftly past the isle ratonneau conspicuous by reason of its towering lighthouse then came the point des catalans with its beach where mercedes had once dwelt and where the unfortunate sailor dantes had seen the light in her chamber window on that memorable night when he was being conducted to captivity at length a black and frowning rock rose before them surmounted by a gloomy fortress as he caught sight of this dismal crag monte cristo knitted his brows and through his clenched teeth muttered an imprecation upon the tyranny of man what is it that so moves you father asked zuleika in a soft voice gazing solicitously into his face look yonder my child replied the count with strong emotion the fortress upon that rock is the accursed chateau d'if zuleika glanced at the fortress with a feeling of terror and dread she knew the story of her father's long imprisonment and keen suffering in the dark dungeon of that forbidding pile of his meetings with the abbe faria there and of his subsequent daring escape but she knew nothing of what had passed between the abbe and the sailor dantes relative to the famous treasure concealed by cardinal spada within the grottoes of the isle of monte cristo the treasure that diverted from the grasp of pope alexander the sixth had made the count so enormously rich on this topic her father had never yet seen fit to enlighten her the sight of the chateau d'ive made her shudder and turn pale though at the same time it fascinated and enchained her she clung closely to monte cristo and said tremulously oh what a frightful place it is my very heart is chilled by its dismal aspect 
dismal as it looks from here my child returned the count it is a thousand times more so within it is the chosen abode of gloom and despair he gently put his daughter from him and gave way to a profound reverie in which he remained plunged for some moments all the details of his imprisonment and the startling adventures that succeeded it passed through his mind in rapid review and an ardent irresistible desire to revisit the locality where he had unearthed spada's millions took entire possession of him suddenly he said to captain vincenzo make for the isle of monte cristo ay ay signor count answered the captain and the necessary orders were at once given the heyday promptly obeying her helm swung about swiftly and gracefully instantly darting off in the direction of the famous island zuleika on hearing her father's command cast upon him a look of astonishment and anxiety she had expected that they would proceed directly to italy and this change in the yacht's course betokened another programme my child said the count divining her thoughts i propose to stop at the isle of monte cristo only a few hours the delay will not be important especially as we can make up the time lost by crowding sail while i wish to show you some spots intimately connected with my history that will interest you i shall be delighted to visit the isle of monte cristo father replied zuleika i have heard so much about it and its wonders you have a mansion there have you not the count smiled as he answered not exactly a mansion zuleika but something that might be made to serve as a substitute for one did we need a temporary refuge though i greatly fear that from long neglect we shall find it at present in a most deplorable condition zuleika's curiosity was now considerably excited what could this mysterious residence or as her father quaintly styled it this substitute for a mansion be like what knowledge she possessed of the isle of monte cristo had been derived from fragmentary recitals made to her by mercedes and her son albert de morcerf but as neither of these informants had ever set foot upon the island their information was necessarily very vague though it made up in the marvellous what it lacked in distinctness at length towards afternoon the rocky shore of the isle of monte cristo became visible the count's visage brightened as he saw it and a thrill of pleasure passed through him though the heyday was yet at a considerable distance he could plainly descry the lofty peak upon which he had stood and watched the smugglers depart in their tartane la jeune amalie on that eventful morning when with his gun and pickaxe he had started out to prosecute his search destined to be fraught with so much excitement and to be crowned with such a glorious dazzling result the golden sunlight fell full upon this peak and the surrounding masses of stone making them glitter as if encrusted with sparkling diamonds of great price here and there grew olive trees and stunted shrubs that stood out distinctly against the blue cloudless sky as the yacht drew nearer their green tints formed a striking contrast with the prevailing hue of the rocks adding vastly to the picturesqueness of the wild and romantic scene presented how beautiful the island looks exclaimed zuleika enthusiastically as she leaned against the bulwarks of the vessel and gazed out over the sea yes replied monte cristo who was standing beside her it does indeed look beautiful from here but a closer view will dispel the charm for the island is nothing but a barren waste what is it a desert asked zuleika in surprise a perfect desert my child answered the count uncultivated and uninhabited uninhabited cried zuleika gazing intently at the shore i certainly see life there look what was that a wild goat leaping from one rock to another returned monte cristo smiling the island is full of them when i said it was uninhabited i meant by human beings the heyday by this time had approached as near the island as possible she was therefore anchored the count then ordered a boat lowered into which he descended with zuleika and ali a stout sailor took the rudder two others grasped the oars and in a few minutes a little cove was gained and the disembarkation effected men said the count addressing the sailors you can now row back to the yacht when you see me come upon the beach and wave my handkerchief thrice return for us 
ay ay signor count answered the coxswain for the boat's crew his words were accompanied by the fall of the oars and the boat shot off towards the heyday you are now on the isle of monte cristo said the count to zuleika as he took her hand to lead her forward prepare to see what you have termed its wonders they will no doubt prove wonders to me at any rate returned the girl smiling the nubian stood before his master with uncovered head respectfully waiting for orders go in advance ali said the count and see that all is right the nubian made a profound salaam in oriental fashion and hastened away the count and his daughter leisurely followed as they walked they disturbed hosts of grasshoppers that leaped with a whirring flutter of wings from the bushes and fled before them this amused zuleika but she could not repress a cry of affright as now and then a green repulsive-looking lizard emerged from under the loose stones beneath her very feet and shot hastily away in search of a more secure hiding-place occasionally too they saw wild goats that pricked up their ears and stared at them with wide open eyes then gathering themselves for a spring bounded off up the rocks and vanished at last monte cristo and zuleika came upon the nubian who had stopped beside a huge boulder that seemed to have lain for ages where it had fallen from the cliffs above a thick bushy growth of wild myrtle and flowering thorn had sprung up around it and its surface was covered with emerald-hued moss the count and his daughter also stopped the former glancing around him at, at the vast stone with evident satisfaction nothing has been touched since i was here last said he as if to himself then turning to ali he added unmask the entrance to the grottoes the nubian produced a rusty crowbar from some nook where he had evidently concealed it in the past thrusting the point beneath the boulder then he exerted a strong steady pressure upon the crowbar and the great rock slowly moved aside disclosing a circular opening in the midst of which was a square flagstone bearing in its centre an iron ring into this ring ali inserted his crowbar and with a mighty effort raised the flagstone from its place a stairway descending apparently to the bowels of the earth was disclosed and from the sombre depths escaped a flow of damp mephitic air zuleika drew back in affright all that had passed since they came to the boulder was strange bewildering and terrifying to her had the days of enchantment returned was ali some potent wizard like aladdin's pretended uncle in the old arabian tale or was she simply under the dominion of some disordered dream her knees trembled beneath her and she moved as if to flee but her father caught her by the arm and his smiling countenance reassured her fear nothing zuleika he said soothingly we are about to visit my subterranean palace that is all by this time the atmosphere of the stairway had become purified and monte cristo said to ali descend and light up the grottoes when all is ready give the usual signal the faithful servant entered the opening and vanished down the stairway soon a delicious oriental perfume ascended this was followed by a vivid illumination of the gaping chasm and then came a long reverberating whistle ali notifies us that all is prepared for our reception said monte cristo to zuleika come my daughter he descended the stairway first zuleika following him in a state of mind difficult to describe she was not afraid now but her sensations were of an exceedingly peculiar nature the novelty and singularity of the adventure rather attracted her though at the same time she felt a sort of reluctance to attempt it however the opening was now as light as day and as they descended the intoxicating perfume increased in intensity until it was almost as if acres of tube roses had suddenly bloomed and filled the caverns with their heavy fragrance at the bottom of the stairway ali received them conducting them into a vast chamber that had evidently once possessed great splendour but was at present dingy and dust-covered as if it had been long deserted it was the apartment in which monte cristo as sinbad the sailor had welcomed the baron franz 
d'epinay years before but the crimson brocade worked with flowers of gold though it still lined the chamber as it did then was now faded and moth-eaten while the turkey carpet in which the baron's feet had sunk to the instep as well as the tapestry hanging in front of the doors was in the same condition the divan in the recess had been riddled by worms and the silver scabbards of the stand of arabian swords that surmounted it were tarnished the gems and the handles of the weapons alone retaining their brilliancy the once beautiful lamp of venice glass hanging from the ceiling which ali had filled and lighted was also tarnished and its delicately shaped globe was cracked from top to bottom monte cristo sadly contemplated this scene of ruin and decay but he contemplated it only for a moment then he turned to zuleika and said my child this was once my salon and its beauty riveted the eyes of all who saw it but i deserted it and time has done its work aided by neglect its beauty is no more shall i raise another ghost of the past and show you its former occupant surely i see him before me do i not said zuleika gazing tenderly at her father not as he was my child not as he was wait here a few moments with my faithful ali as your guard and protector and i will invoke the fantastic apparition as he spoke he raised the faded tapestry revealing the door leading to the inner apartment opening this door and closing it behind him he was lost to sight the tapestry fell back to its place masking the point of entrance after a brief absence he reappeared dressed in his famous tunisian costume but that alas had also lost its pristine glory like everything else in this abandoned subterranean abode still the wrecks were there the red cap with the long blue silk tassel the vest of black cloth embroidered with gold the pantaloons of deep red the large full gaiters of the same colour embroidered with gold like the vest the yellow slippers the cashmere around his waist and the small crooked kanjir passed through his girdle zuleika gazed at him in amazement in his faded tarnished moth-eaten finery he indeed looked like a fantastic apparition a picturesque ghost of the past come zuleika said he as i am in my festal attire let us visit the salle à manger he moved aside the tapestry once more and again opened the door leading to the other apartment zuleika entered and the count followed her ali remaining in the outer chamber to guard against surprise or intrusion the marvellous salle à manger was precisely the same as the baron de pinay had seen it here time seemed to have been defied the marble of which the magnificent apartment was built was as bright and beautiful as ever the antique bas-reliefs of priceless value were well preserved and the four superb statues with baskets on their heads were yet in their places in the corners of the oblong room and yet perfect though no pyramids of splendid fruit now filled the baskets in the centre of the salle a manger the dining-table still stood with its dishes of silver and plates of japanese china it was at this table that both the baron de Apennes and maximilian morel had taken that wonderful green preparation that key to the gate of divine dreams that hashis of alexandria hashis of abu Ghor it was at this table that maximilian when falling under the influence of the potent drug had caught his first glimpse of his beloved valentine after her supposed death it was at this table that he had been reunited to her on awakening from his hashis dream it was in this room that haydee had confessed her love for monte cristo and had been taken to his heart all these recollections came thronging upon the count as he stood gazing about him the thought of haydee almost melted him to tears but he forced back the briny drops and taking zuleika tenderly in his arms cried out in a voice full of emotion oh haydee haydee i have lost you but you live for me again in this blessed treasure you have bequeathed to me our darling daughter zuleika flung her arms about her father's neck and kissed him fervently i know not she said effusively what memories what associations this room recalls but it has made you think of my mother and i bless it 
when they both had grown calmer monte cristo said to his daughter there is yet another apartment for us to see let us go to it they entered the adjoining chamber it was a strangely furnished apartment circular in shape it was surrounded by a large divan which as well as the walls ceiling and floor was covered with what had been magnificent skins of the large maned lions of atlas striped bengal tiger spotted panthers of the cape bears of siberia and foxes of norway but all these elegant furs that were strewn in profusion one over another had been eaten by moths and worms and rotted by the dampness until they scarcely held together the divan was that upon which the baron de Pignet had reclined and the chibougs with jasmine tubes and amber mouthpieces that he had seen prepared so that there was no need to smoke the same pipe twice were still in their places and were the only things in the whole room that had escaped from the clutch of years unscathed this chamber was brilliantly illuminated by the blaze of several large lamps of tarnished silver and gold suspended from the ceiling and protruding from the walls and the salle à manger was lighted in the same fashion zuleika stood in the midst of all this decayed grandeur lost in wonder utterly bewildered by what she beheld she spoke not a single syllable for words were inadequate to express her deep amazement monte cristo threw himself upon the divan from which a cloud of stifling dust arose taking one of the chibouks in which a supply of turkish tobacco yet remained he lighted it and began to smoke zuleika now saw that the heavy delicious perfume with which the grotto palace was filled came from frankincense smouldering in a huge malachite vase placed in the centre of this bewildering chamber after he had puffed a few whiffs of smoke from the chibouk monte cristo removed the amber mouthpiece from his lips and rising said you have now seen my subterranean abode zuleika the abode where in the past i sought refuge from the world and solace for my woes it seems to you like the product of some potent magician's spell and in truth it was so but that magician was good fortune and the spell was colossal wealth to the vast and subtle influence of which all nations and all lands yield slavish submission and implicit obedience you do not know the romantic incredible history of this abode my daughter and it is not my intention to relate it to you for your youthful brain could scarcely comprehend it be satisfied then with what you have beheld treasure it in your memory if you will either as a reality or merely as a passing vision but do not i conjure you ever mention this adventure to me or any other living soul i have had confidence in you my child repay that confidence by strictly obeying this wish nay this command of mine these grottoes belong to the past and to oblivion to the past and to oblivion therefore let them be consigned promise me to do as i desire amazed by this strange speech which the count uttered in a voice tremulous with emotion as much as by any of the inexplicable wonders she had seen zuleika replied in a tone full of agitation i promise solemnly promise father to fulfil your injunctions in this matter to the very letter i have a woman's curiosity and a woman's inclination to gossip she added with a faint smile but for your dear sake i will repress them both at least so far as concerns this truly marvellous subterranean palace and our visit to it to-day and you will keep your word my noble child said monte cristo gazing tenderly and admiringly at her now i will remove this tunis dress in which i have been without doubt exceedingly ridiculous in your eyes for you are altogether unacquainted with the associations that surround it and endear it to me dignify it so to speak beyond any other costume i have ever worn zuleika lifted her hands in protest exclaiming you could not dear father appear ridiculous in my eyes no matter in what garb you were clothed monte cristo smiled approvingly but a trifle incredulously and quitted the circular apartment when he returned he was clad in the costume he had worn on coming from the yacht take a last look around you zuleika he said in a tone he vainly endeavoured to render firm 
we are now about to quit this place for ever he took her hand and led her from the room slowly and as if regretfully they passed through the salle a manger and the apartment they had first entered gaining the stairway and preparing to ascend it at the foot of the steps monte cristo paused and turned to ali he was ghastly pale and trembled slightly with a powerful effort he however controlled his agitation ali said he in a voice that sounded strangely in zuleika's ear is everything in readiness the faithful nubian scarcely less affected than his master bowed affirmatively then farewell ye grottoes of monte cristo cried the count excitedly farewell for ever he hastily mounted the stairway almost dragging zuleika with him ali remained below when they reached the open air they paused until the mute joined them then the little party regained the beach where monte cristo waved his handkerchief thrice in obedience to this signal the boat immediately left the yacht and was pulled swiftly to the shore a few moments later the count zuleika and ali were safely deposited on the heyday's deck and the gallant little vessel turned her prow towards the italian coast monte cristo and his daughter with ali at a short distance from them stood closely watching the fast disappearing island the count was more agitated and paler than he had yet been nervous tremors shook his frame and his teeth were firmly clenched the usually impassable countenance of the faithful nubian mute wore an expression of blank horror zuleika gazed at her father and then at the servant she knew not what to make of their strange inexplicable emotion placing her hand upon the count's shoulder she was about to speak to him to endeavour to calm his agitation when suddenly there was a loud explosion on the isle of monte cristo and a huge column of black smoke shot up into the air the count covered his face with his hands as if to shut out the sight ali fell prostrate upon the deck pressing his contorted visage against his master's feet what was that o oh, father what was that cried zuleika clinging to the count in wild alarm the subterranean palace of the isle of monte cristo is no more he replied sadly at my command it replaced with its magnificence the rude and shapeless grottoes at my command it has perished as he spoke the rocky island was gradually lost to view in the distance and the heyday sped over the waves of the mediterranean like some glorious waterfowl in full flight End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one zuleika learns the truth nothing occurred to impede the progress of the heyday and after a rapid and pleasant voyage the beautiful craft cast anchor in the harbour of civita vecchia the principal seaport city of the pontifical states which owes its origin to the emperor trajan the strict quarantine regulations of the place caused a brief delay which monte cristo and zuleika bore with ill-concealed impatience but the period required by law for purification at length expired and the travellers were accorded official permission to proceed to rome of this they immediately availed themselves and in a short time were in the eternal city comfortably installed in the best apartments the hotel de france afforded the count's first care was to send his card to monsieur and madame morel who at once hastened to his parlour where the most cordial greetings were exchanged that monte cristo should be in rome did not in the slightest degree astonish maximilian and valentine who were fully aware of his habit of suddenly making his appearance in unexpected spots apparently without motive but the presence of zuleika at this critical juncture both surprised them and filled them with consternation 
what answer should they make to her when she inquired concerning giovanni how was the fact of his sad condition to be kept from her when all rome knew of it and it was the current gossip of the city valentine had written several letters to the girl since quitting paris but in them had dealt only in generalities she had studiously refrained from informing her of the true state of things hoping against hope that she would eventually have some cheering intelligence to impart the count however speedily relieved the devoted husband and wife of their anxiety he knew as well as they that his daughter could not fail soon to learn that the viscount was a maniac and preferred to break the terrible news to her himself as soon therefore as the greetings were over before zuleika could whisper to madame morel the question that was trembling on her lips the dreaded inquiry as to her lover and his whereabouts he said in a quiet tone maximilian and valentine you no doubt wonder why we have come to rome what is our business here i will tell you we have come to clear an unfortunate man the viscount giovanni massetti of a fearful charge that has long hung over him monsieur and madame morel exchanged glances now was their time to speak to avow their mission to monte cristo count said maximilian pointing to his wife we also came hither on the same errand zuleika confessed her love for the young italian to valentine who extracted from her the nature of the charge to which you have just alluded pardon us for having acted without your authorization but we desired to succeed before confessing to you the part we had taken in the affair monte cristo smiled you need no pardon from me he said gently much affected by this proof of devotion to his daughter and through her to him on the contrary you have my gratitude as well as zuleika's but what success have you met with alas none of any moment as yet answered m morrel sadly such a result was to be expected returned the count gravely you had no evidence to establish giovanni's innocence and it was impossible for you to obtain any i have the evidence conclusive evidence when the proper moment arrives i will produce it remove the stain from his name and confound his enemies thank god simultaneously exclaimed m and madame morrel valentine taking zuleika in her arms kissing her and clasping her to her bosom but continued monte cristo glancing anxiously at his daughter the unfortunate young man must first be taken in hand and cured maximilian and valentine again exchanged glances they felt relieved the count knew all he was making the disclosure gradually considerately they silently waited for further developments holding their breath valentine's heart beat almost audibly zuleika started from her arms and gazed at her father with anxious astonished eyes cured she repeated in a tremulous voice is giovanni ill he is my child answered the count what would he say next how much was he going to disclose surely not the whole of the dreadful truth these thoughts shot like lightning through the minds of monsieur and madame morel maximilian stood like a statue motionless pale gazing upon monte cristo as a condemned criminal gazes upon his executioner valentine seized her husband's hand and held it like a vice zuleika stared at the morels she could not understand their action their breathless interest then her glance reverted to her father and for the first time she saw that notwithstanding his apparent calmness he too was under the dominion of some intense emotion 
father she cried clasping her hands appealingly what do you mean you say that giovanni is ill but your look expresses more than your words with what fearful malady has he been stricken tell me i conjure you i will be strong i will bear it my child said the count in a solemn tone then summon all your courage all your firmness to your aid young massetti overwhelmed by his troubles has fallen a prey to a mental disease mon dieu mon dieu groaned zuleika in anguish do you mean to say that he has lost his mind that he is a lunatic such alas is the case but my daughter trust in me i will find him and science will effect his cure the poor girl stunned by the terrible intelligence of her lover's condition stood for an instant with her eyes stonily fixed upon her father tears refused to come to her relief then she tottered staggered as if she had been suddenly struck with a heavy missile and fell fainting into valentine's outstretched arms maximilian assisted his wife to place her in a fauteuil after which he seized the bell-cord for what are you going to ring asked monte cristo who had hurried to his daughter's side for brandy answered m morrel his hand still on the cord it will revive her never mind the brandy returned the count as he took a small vial containing a red-looking fluid from his pocket and opening zuleika's mouth poured eight drops of the liquid down her throat this is the abbe faria's elixir a potent remedy that never yet failed of effect it will work like a charm see it is already doing its office as he uttered these words zuleika moved slightly in the fauteuil then opened her eyes and gazed about her in bewilderment almost immediately however she realized that she had swooned and a full sense of her father's terrible though considerately made revelation returned to her she buried her face in her hands quivered from head to foot and then the glistening drops trickling through her fingers told that the tears had at last come to calm her valentine bent over her gently stroking her raven hair and endeavouring in a womanly way to soothe her while the count and maximilian looked on with anxious countenances waiting for madame morel's touch and influence to do their work suddenly zuleika removed her hands from her tear-bathed visage straightened herself up in the fauteuil and fixing her glance on monte cristo said in a low faint and gasping tone that betrayed the depth the intensity of her emotion father you spoke of finding giovanni has he disappeared the count compressed his lips hesitating to reply he wished to keep back as much of the dread truth as possible he feared the effect upon his daughter of the startling announcement that young massetti was wandering about amid the ruins of the Colosseum like a second king lear on the blasted heath but maximilian came quickly to his aid there is no need to find the viscount he said he has already been found and is at present under treatment in a suitable institution where he is both comfortable and contented zuleika cast a grateful look at m and madame morrel monte cristo seized maximilian's hand and pressed it warmly you have done this my friend said he his countenance brightening and i thank you for it do not thank me replied the husband gazing fondly and admiringly at his wife thank valentine for she it was who formed the plan and successfully carried it into execution madame morrel cast down her eyes and a heightened colour overspread her charming face you are an angel valentine exclaimed monte cristo enthusiastically maximilian said a while ago that no success of any moment had as yet crowned your united efforts but his statement was too modest your success has been conspicuous you have taken the first step that i design making 
and simplified my task to a marked degree i am deeply indebted to you both monsieur and madame morel lifted their hands and shook their heads in protest the debt is all on our side said maximilian deprecatingly and no matter what we may do we can never discharge it we owe you the happiness of our lives monte cristo turned the conversation he took but little credit to himself for the benefits he had conferred upon his fellow-creatures considering that every good action on his part went towards atoning for the terrible catastrophes he had caused in the prosecution of his relentless vengeance against his old-time enemies tell me said he addressing m morrel what is the viscount's present condition is he recovering maximilian looked hastily in the direction of zuleika the poor girl was intently watching him eagerly waiting for his answer his voice was somewhat unsteady as he replied ever since he was placed in the institution of which i told you he has received the closest and most skilful care but his progress is very slow almost imperceptible though the physician who is ministering to him has never ceased to assure us that he will ultimately regain the full possession of his health and senses oh take me to him take me to him at once cried zuleika starting to her feet my place is by his side i will nurse him i will cure him monte cristo glanced at maximilian who shook his head negatively and whispered in the count's ear it will never do to take her to him now the shock of seeing him would be too great he would not even recognize her he recognizes no one zuleika divined enough of what was passing to realize that maximilian opposed her wishes was striving to prevent her from going to her lover from ministering to his wants she sprang to her father clasped her arms about his neck and looking pitifully and pleadingly into his face exclaimed oh take me to giovanni take me to him do not deny your loving dutiful daughter's most earnest prayer do not deny it o oh, my beloved father do not deny it monte cristo was touched to the very depths of his soul monsieur and madame morrel were equally affected the count however instantly decided what was to be done tenderly compassionately embracing his daughter he said to her in a soothing voice my child for the present it is best that you do not go to giovanni i will see him for you and without delay put a plan in operation that i do not doubt will result in his speedy cure i know a wondrous physician whose skill is so great that he can almost restore the dead to life he belongs to the despised race of jews but is a good as well as a marvellous man his name is dr israel absalom and he resides here in rome within the walls of the shunned and execrated ghetto near the capitoline mount i will go to him at once and take him to young massetti my daughter rest assured that this learned hebrew will work another miracle and give your lover back to you and in all the glory of his mind and manhood be content therefore to remain where you are for a brief period with our devoted friend valentine as your companion and comforter yes zuleika said madame morrel persuasively be content to remain with me i will not quit you even for an instant we will talk of giovanni of the happiness and joy the future has in store for both of you and believe me the hours will pass on rapid wings as valentine spoke she gently disengaged the girl from her father's neck and passed her arm lovingly around her slender waist zuleika's head sank upon her friend's shoulder i yield to my father's solicitations and to your own valentine she said submissively you are older and wiser than i am and what you say is without doubt for the best i will remain and trust to the wondrous physician i have heard a great deal of this dr absalom since i have been in rome said 
m morel addressing monte cristo the common people regard him as a magician and the higher classes as a cunning charlatan but if his legitimate scientific skill is generally denied his brilliant and marvellous success even in cases that the best roman physicians have abandoned as hopeless is universally admitted dr absalom is neither a magician nor a charlatan answered monte cristo warmly but a physician of the utmost experience and of the highest possible attainments he is bent beneath the weight of years and arduous study yet his eye is as keen and his perception as acute as if he were a youth of twenty no man knows either his age or his history i met him long ago in athens where i had the good fortune to rescue him from the clutches of a howling mob of ruffians who had seized upon him and were about to slay him as a sorcerer because he had taken into his hut and cured of the plague a wretched greek who had been cast into the streets to die for my sake he will save giovanni but said maximilian as a sudden thought occurred to him and filled him with dismay dr absalom can practise outside of the ghetto only by stealth and at the risk of being thrown into prison he will not be allowed to visit the viscount massetti the count of monte cristo drew himself up proudly and his peculiar smile passed over his countenance i will take care of that he said impressively zuleika was left with madame morrel and accompanied by maximilian monte cristo at once started for the ghetto End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two the wondrous physician a brisk walk of half an hour brought the count and his companion to one of the two gates in the wall of the ghetto or jews quarter of rome monte cristo knocked at a wicket and a policeman immediately appeared he was a young man and wore a military dress his coat was buttoned to the throat a yellow cord and tassel gracefully looped over the breast his hands were encased in white cotton gloves a helmet adorned with brass was upon his head and at his side hung a sword while on the collar of his coat the number of his regiment shone in gilt figures the man's bearing was soldierly and he had evidently seen service in the field the count addressed him in italian informing him that he and m morrel desired to visit the ghetto at the same time exhibiting their passports after examining the papers and seeing that they were in proper form the policeman opened the gate and the visitors entered the crowded and filthy precincts of the jews quarter mon dieu what vile odours exclaimed m morel placing his handkerchief saturated with cologne to his nose as they hurried through the narrow garbage encumbered lanes the atmosphere is not like that of a perfumer's shop replied the count laughing but it seems to suit the children of israel for they thrive and multiply in it as the sparrows in the pure air and green fields of england i pity them said maximilian tastes differ returned monte cristo philosophically i will wager that in this whole quarter we could not find a single jew who would eat a partridge in that state of partial decay in which a frenchman deems it most palatable what a strange uncouth place this is said m morrel after a brief silence it seems like some city of the far orient no one suddenly transported here would ever imagine that he was in the heart of rome it closely resembles the juden gasse at frankfort on the Main, replied the count and is quite as ancient though much larger but the germans are more progressive and liberal than the romans for the gates that closed the judengasse were removed in eighteen o six while those of the ghetto still remain and are as you have seen in charge of the police who subject every person entering or quitting the place to the closest scrutiny 
even as far back as the seventeenth century the gates of the judengasse were shut and locked only at nightfall after which no jew could venture into any other part of frankfurt without incurring a heavy penalty if caught whereas here at the present time in this age of enlightenment and religious toleration the gates of the ghetto are kept closed day and night and the poor israelites victims of bigotry and unreasoning prejudice are treated worse than the pariahs in hindustan rome is the eternal city and verily its faults are as eternal as itself monte cristo had evidently visited the ghetto before as he seemed thoroughly familiar with its crooked lanes and obscure byways pursuing his course without hesitation or pause for inquiry it apparently contained no new sights or surprises for him to m morel on the contrary who now was within its walls for the first time it presented an unending series of wonders the buildings particularly impressed him they looked as if erected away back in remote antiquity and were curiously quaint combinations of wood and stone exceedingly picturesque in appearance most of them were not more than eight or ten feet wide and towered to a height of four stories resembling dwarf steeples rather than houses not a new or modern edifice was to be seen in any direction many of the buildings were in a ruinous condition and some seemed actually about to crumble to pieces while here and there great piles of shapeless rubbish marked the spots where others had fallen as they were passing one of these piles much larger than the rest maximilian called monte cristo's attention to it the count glanced at it and said that was once the dwelling of old isaac nabal known to his people as isaac the money-lender but styled by the romans isaac the usurer he was enormously rich and loaned his gold at exorbitant rates to the extravagant and impecunious roman nobles isaac was wifeless and childless but so eager for gain was he that he kept his house constantly filled with lodgers the house was perhaps the oldest in all the ghetto strange noises were heard in it every night occasioned by the falling of plaster or partition walls it was no uncommon thing for a lodger to be suddenly roused from his sleep by a crash and find himself bruised and bleeding still old isaac sturdily refused to make repairs he asserted that the rickety edifice would last as long as he did and he was not wrong for one night it came down bodily about his ears and he perished amid the ruins together with thirty others all who were in the aged rookery at the time this catastrophe happened twenty years ago do the houses often fall here asked m morrel glancing uneasily around him at the dilapidated buildings very often answered the count age and decay will bring them all down sooner or later then for heaven's sake let us hasten lest we be crushed beneath some sudden wreck said maximilian the houses project over the street at the upper stories until they almost join each other in mid-air if one should fall there would be no escape have no fear maximilian replied monte cristo smiling a famous astrologer once assured me that i bore a charmed life and if i escape you will also the ground floors of the houses were for the most part occupied as shops of various kinds and the upper portions used as dwellings jewish merchants stood at the doors of the shops and jewish women some of them very beautiful were occasionally seen at the upper windows the streets were thronged with pedestrians of both sexes and here and there groups of chubby black-haired children were at play maximilian was amazed to notice that most of the men they met took off their hats to monte cristo and that some of them saluted him by name you appear to be pretty well known to the israelites said he at length yes answered the count many of them know me i have had frequent occasion to consult with them on matters of importance they are a shrewd and trusty people 
by this time monte cristo and m morrel had reached a lane narrower and darker than any they had yet traversed into this the count turned and after he had taken his companion a short distance stopped in front of a dingy but well-preserved building it differed from its neighbours in having no shop on the ground floor and in being tightly closed from bottom to top it looked as if it were uninhabited we have reached our destination said monte cristo this is the residence of dr absalom maximilian stared at him in astonishment the house is deserted said he are you not mistaken no this is the place i fear then that the physician has left it and perhaps also the ghetto monte cristo smiled you do not know him he said his habits and manner of living are very peculiar prepare to be greatly surprised thus speaking he went to the door of the tightly closed dwelling and struck five loud raps upon it three very quickly and two very slowly delivered the sound seemed to reverberate through the house as if it were not only uninhabited but also unfurnished several minutes elapsed but no response was heard to monte cristo's signal no one came in obedience to his summons the count held his watch in his hand and his eyes were riveted upon the dial m morrel grew slightly impatient he said to his companion triumphantly i told you that the house was deserted and i was right the count smiled again but made no reply still keeping his eyes fixed on the dial of his watch ten minutes said he and he repeated his signal but this time struck only three rapid blows as before no answer was returned maximilian was much interested and not a little amused the count's proceedings were so singular fifteen minutes said monte cristo at length putting up his watch and giving one long resounding rap upon the door the effect was instantaneous the portal swung open through some unseen influence as if by magic disclosing a long bare gloomy corridor but not a sign of human life was visible m morrel's interest and amusement changed to wonder and amazement he was thoroughly mystified and bewildered the common people of rome are not very far astray in their estimate of this dr absalom he muttered this certainly looks as if the man were a magician pshaw returned monte cristo with a display of impatience he rarely exhibited the learned hebrew is compelled to take his precautions that is all follow me and no matter what you may see or hear if you wish our enterprise to be crowned with success utter not a word not a sound until i give you permission the count entered the corridor followed by his perplexed and astounded friend immediately the door closed noiselessly behind them and they found themselves amid thick darkness monte cristo took m morrel by the hand leading him forward until their progress was completely barred by what appeared to be the end of the corridor here the count paused and said some words in hebrew a faint response came promptly from beyond the corridor in the same language and immediately the light of a lamp flashed upon the visitors a door had opened and on the threshold stood the strangest-looking specimen of humanity maximilian had ever beheld the newcomer was a very aged man with stooped shoulders a long white beard that reached to his waist and a profusion of snowy hair that escaped from beneath a cap of purple velvet at the side of which hung a bright crimson tassel he wore a long persian caftan of pink satin profusely and beautifully embroidered with gold full oriental trousers of red velvet and elaborately adorned slippers of tiger skin on his long bony fingers sparkled several diamond rings undoubtedly of immense value and a cluster of brilliant emeralds magnificently set in gold adorned his breast this singular vision of eastern luxury wealth and sumptuousness held the lamp which was of wrought bronze and resembled those found among the ruins of ancient pompeii above his head and by its light maximilian could see that his eyes were keen and piercing and that his countenance betokened the highest intellectuality 
who is it that thus summons the sage from his meditations asked the old man in a remarkably youthful voice this time he spoke in italian one who served you in the past oh dr absalom replied monte cristo also using the language of italy and who now solicits a service of you in return remember the mob of athens and the frank who interposed to save you from destruction the old man lowered his lamp and held it close to his famous visitor's face then he joyfully exclaimed welcome edmond dantes count of monte cristo welcome to the abode of your devoted servant israel absalom whatever he can do to serve you shall be done no matter at what cost then for the first time he observed that the count was not alone and fixed his keen eyes on m morrel with a look of suspicion and inquiry one of my dearest friends m maximilian morrel captain in the army of france said monte cristo in answer to this look you can have as full confidence in him as in me dr absalom bowed profoundly to m morrel and without another word led the way to an inner apartment it was a vast chamber closed like the front of the house brilliantly illuminated by a huge chandelier suspended from the ceiling in which burned twenty wax candles of various hues the room was provided with all the apparatus and paraphernalia of a chemist's laboratory of modern days also containing many strange instruments and machines such as aided the researches and labours of the old-time disciples of alchemy in the centre of the apartment stood a vast table covered with gigantic parchment-bound tomes and rolls of yellow manuscript behind this table was a huge high-backed chair of elaborate antique workmanship resembling the throne of some asiatic sovereign of the remote past in this chair the physician seated himself after having installed his visitors each upon a commodious and comfortable turkish divan maximilian noticed that the floor of the room was covered with soft and elegant persian rugs and that the walls were hung with exquisitely beautiful tapestry monte cristo had warned him to prepare to be greatly surprised but dr absalom's lavish display of wealth luxury and taste in the midst of the filthy dilapidated ghetto nevertheless absolutely stunned him the count had also cautioned him not to speak without his permission a useless injunction for the young frenchman was too much amazed to utter a syllable after seating himself the hebrew sage who seemed to be a man of business as well as of science requested the count to state in what he could serve him thereupon monte cristo succinctly related the history of the viscount massetti told of his mental malady his confinement in the insane asylum and ended by asking the physician if he could and would cure him i have already heard somewhat of this unfortunate young man replied dr absalom and the fact of his insanity was also imparted to me but before expressing an opinion as to what my science can do in his case i must have the particulars the count motioned to m morrel who having by this time partially recovered from his bewilderment at once proceeded to give the aged hebrew the information he required when he had concluded dr absalom said in a quiet confident tone count of monte cristo the case is plain i can and will cure this stricken young italian i was sure of it cried the count joyously and triumphantly m morrel was not less delighted but at the same time he could not feel as confident as his friend of the jew's ability to perform his promise the physician spoke a few words in hebrew to monte cristo the reply of the latter seemed to give him entire satisfaction for he said in italian in that event there will be no opposition from either the authorities of rome or those of the insane asylum i will be at the asylum at noon to-morrow fully prepared to restore massetti to health and reason the count and maximilian arose and bidding the sage adieu were conducted by him to the corridor they were soon in the street and made their way out of the ghetto as speedily as possible 
End of chapter 22